All right, there we go. Sorry, I turned myself off. It's fun when you, uh, you break your little stand as you're going in. That is a classic right there, if you've never seen it. Uh, yeah, it's a classic roach. I'm not going to recommend it, but uh, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if that's going to work so well. It was working earlier. I'm going to blame Marcy on this one. What is happening? <laughs> We're just going to spend today trying to figure this out. I'm not a computer guy, but I think this thing's loose right here. Something's loose right it here. doesn't tighten, though. That's the thing, is I tighten that. Yeah. But if it was a transmission, I know you'd be all over this. I'd be all over this. <laughs> <laughs> we might be doing the old hold it in my hand business today. All right, there we go. I'll figure this out next service. <laughs> all right. Now that you watched me do that for the last three and a half minutes, let's move on to our series, I Want a New Marriage. It's not going to be what you think it might be, which is how we typically do things. You think in your mind it's going to be a certain way and it ends up being a different way. But today we're going to be talking about defining expectations. What does it mean to define expectations? If you think about it, we all have expectations walking into relationships, marriages of any kind. And today is no different. I want to read to you guys something that might sound very familiar. Even if you've never said these words, it's going to be very familiar to you if you've been around long enough. I take you to be my wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until parted by death. Sounds familiar, right? Some variation of those vows have been said by many of these people in this room and watching online. Today, millions of people remember these vows because it will be anniversaries and or they're having their wedding today. These are very, very common. I want to show you a picture. This is my wedding day right here. And you guys have probably seen this picture, right? This is just one of the moments, right? She's so excited. She's getting married. Uh, we're a lot younger than 18 years ago in November. That was us. Uh, my hair was a lot darker then. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was like the next year that my hair did this. I'm not going to say it was from being married, but I, I, it's a coincidence? I don't know. And this, this was us. Do you guys remember your wedding day? I remember my wedding day. I do. I remember. It was memor it's memorable because it was impactful. It was, it was a very significant time in my life. It was a relationship for me that is important. But sometimes weddings can be dangerous. You ever know that? Did you know weddings can be dangerous. As we define expectations today, I want to share with you about the first wedding that I ever performed as a pastor. Yes, yeah, she's already laughing. Uh, the reason that she's laughing was because that was my second date with my wife. I took her to a wedding that I was doing. And we were, uh, we were at Newport Harbor, and if you're familiar with California, it's on the ocean, and we were at Newport Beach, and we got on a boat. So it was a wedding on a boat. And we're on this boat, and it was this very, very young couple. Uh, he, he had kind of helped in the, in the youth group for a couple months, and he's like, James, would you mind doing my wedding? And I was like, absolutely. Your, your girlfriend, your fiance was in my small group. Absolutely. I would totally do your wedding. And so I came, and I brought Alyssa with me because uh, I'd already asked her out, and then I, that was the day that we were going out. So I was like, you want to go to a wedding? She's like, sure, I love weddings. I'm like, I, not, not for us, just <laughs> clarifying, right? It is the second date. We're not that crazy. And when and I show up, and I get on the boat, and it's so nice, and it's beautiful, and, and, and it's, I mean, the, the boat is probably the, the size of just these, the the four seating areas here, and then imagine the walls are where James is and, and, and where Susan is, and that's where the walls are. So it's not a huge boat, but it went back fairly far. And I remember standing there, and behind me was an altar, and there was this beautiful flower arrangement. Oh, my goodness. They spent hours on this flower arrangement. And there was a table, and it had communion elements because one of they wanted to do is, is a, they wanted to have communion as a, as a married couple. And there was the unity candles. How many of you guys had unity candles at your wedding? Oh, yeah, some of you guys. We had one too, didn't we? Yes, my mom lit the candle. Your mom lit the candle. I remember it. It's okay. It's, I remember it. <laughs> didn't my mom light the candle? No? Yes. Okay, so then there was. There was a unity candle. All right. <laughs> 
But all of this stuff was happening, and I'm getting ready, and I'm a little nervous because this is the first wedding I've ever done. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not even married at this point, and I'm already doing weddings. And, and they, they come in, and the bride's coming up, and the groom's losing it. He starts crying, which you guys know makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, get together. We're on a boat. And he, you know, he figures it out, and she comes up, and, and she, they're standing next to each other, and they're so in love, and they're looking at each, into each other's eyes, and, and, and I start the process, and I say, we're so excited to be here today to celebrate with friends and family. We are, we're, we're, we're acknowledging their, com their commitment to each other, and, all, and I'm just going off. Now, a couple of things happen. One, I forgot to have them sit down, so they're standing this whole time. And I see the wedding coordinator in the back doing this, and I'm thinking she's bowing, like, I'm doing so good. You're doing so good, James. And I'm like, yeah, yeah I am doing so good. Finally, I was like, oh, you guys, you can actually have a seat. Sorry. And they sat down, and I'm in the middle of this process, and I'm talking about love and 1 Corinthians, and you know, the love knows no bounds, and I'm just going off, and it's beautiful. And all of a sudden, I see some faces, and there's some panic on people's faces, and I'm wondering, what is happening? What, did, now am I just blowing it? Is this a terrible wedding? I don't, I'm looking at my notes. Did I, did I cuss? What happened? Why are, what's the face? And they start doing this. So then I'm going, huh. It's not usually a good thing to interrupt a wedding ceremony by pointing like this. So I turn around, and the flowers had caught on fire. <laughs> the blasted unity candles had fallen over. And the flowers are now inflamed. And I'm going, oh, that's not good. We're on a boat, guys. This is like Titanic. This is the beginning of Titanic. <laughs> and I turn around, and, and the, groom comes, the groom comes over, and we're, we're patting this thing out. And there was a little bit of water, and we, we splashed, because it was like in a vase with some flowers. And we're, we're, we're splashing it. And I think I'm getting too close to the mic. And we're, we're putting the fire out. And everyone's just laughing at this point. No one's helping they're laughing at me and the groom is doing his thing and the bride's just smiling and just looking beautiful and we're just trying to put this fire out literally and figuratively and we finally get the flower out and I don't even remember what I said the rest of the service I do not I don't even know if they're legally married today because I don't know I don't know because I was so distracted with what was happening but what was awesome was after we're done Everyone came up to me and they're like, that was such a lovely service, right? Because no one ever tells you you're terrible at something. You know, you don't usually finish a sermon and they're like, oh, man, you, you weren't on your A-game today. You need to figure things out next week. No one ever says that. Typically, it's always a nice thing or a nice sermon. And everyone's like, oh, such a beautiful ceremony. And I'm like, were you at the same one I was at? You didn't sit down for a half an hour and the flowers caught on fire. But we all have these memorable times when we think about our wedding day. Maybe it's not that crazy <laughs> memorable, right, where things are on fire literally. But I think we can relate to it. And today we're going to talk about marriage. And if you're married, you were married, or you're planning to get married one day, this message is still for you. Because at the very baseline level of what we're talking about today, it is about relationships. It is about, <laughs> I'm getting those amber alerts. Uh, it's about the, not the Amber Alerts, because no one's being kidnapped, the fire one, right? And you, you have this baseline of relationship with people, and in marriages, and in friendships, and in brotherhood and sisterhood. So at the very baseline, this gives you something to build off of. And secondly, this may prepare you for what's to come, whether you're married, you were married, or you're going to be married. This can prepare you for what's to come. Because let's, let me give you a fun, some fun stuff here. I did some research on Focus on the Family, and it says that, that kids' mental and emotional health are affected by your marriage. I think you guys knew that. Absolutely. The stronger the marriage, the stronger the emotional health of your children. If we go to a biblical standpoint on this, the word wedding is spoken in context 21 times, and the word husband or wife is spoken in context 145 times. So this is talked about probably the second most behind money. This is a big deal. And within marriage, there's always expectations. So let's look at three expectations that we have. But before we do, we're going we're gonna to start off with our key verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. 
But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So let's look at marriage breaker number one. If you look at your marriage as a temporary commitment, this is not a good indicator that your marriage is going to make it. Because the expectations at the very core is selfish. Your expectation and your desire is temporary because you have not made a commitment in your heart. By definition, selfishness is temporary, right? Because your, chain, your, your wants change. The thing that you want now and you have to have now will change later. And it will continue to change. That is at the very definition of selfishness. But now I'm going to expand that thought a little bit in a second. But I remember in junior high, some of you guys, let's remember back to junior high. For some of you guys, it's, it's a little bit closer than others, but it's okay. But I remember junior high, I had a junior high girlfriend. I had a couple different girlfriends, but this girlfriend in particular, I remember because I remember asking her, will you be my girlfriend? And she said, yes, comma, for now. We were going to be in love forever. And let me tell you, that six-day romance was magical. It didn't make it through the weekend, but that, that six days from Sunday to Friday was just absolutely magic. And we were going to be together forever. And it didn't dawn on me as a seventh, eighth grader that when she said for now that we were doomed. And let me tell you, it was not Alyssa, so it was doomed. I made it six days, right? But imagine saying that to significant relationships in your life. Imagine saying that. Imagine saying, will you marry me? And your spouse or your future spouse or a future fiance, I should say, says, sure, for now. Does that elicit confidence in you? No. Well, let's, let's dive even further. Let's, let's just go to friendship. Hey, you want to be friends? Sure, for now. Do you want to be my dad? Sure, for now. See, in a relationship, any context, when you don't make a commitment, it does not breed confidence. And when you're looking at your marriage, if you start using the D word and the S word all over the place, not the swear words, but divorce and separation, if you start using those words as common vocabulary, you are getting closer and closer to the temporary commitment because you are constantly giving yourself outs. You're constantly allowing your life to have this, well, you know what? Eh, it's temporary. It's fine. We can try divorce. Let's tr we can always get remarried. You know, we'll, we'll do it right the second time. Separation, that's eh, a trial. But when you start putting those outs, it creates this, this disconnect. Now, what does God say about this? He says in 1 John 4, 7, and I just read this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for what? Love comes from God. So you have the breaker, which is a temporary commitment. The marriage maker is a lifetime commitment. A lifetime commitment means that with your entire life, you are committed to this relationship. And that's a big deal. See, God's love, and this is why I read this verse, in our lives, allows other, ourselves to love like him. That's what it does. So the first step when we're talking about Marriage Maker One is to allow God's love to be a real experience for you. Experience his love. Why, though? Let's go back to why. Because here's what happened. When God breathed life into your lungs, he made a commitment to you. He did. When God says, I'm going to create you, and he put his breath into your lungs, he made a commitment to you, to me. He committed to being a part of your life till the end, and then some, if we choose it. And his love for us has been passed down to us. See, the, by biblical definition, God is love. I just read that, right? And by loving others, we show them that we are a different person, that we are not the same. And I love that. And I kind of thought of like a, just a quick analogy to help you kind of understand what that means, where if we are saturated by God's love, then it just, it becomes easier for others to experience it. If I came up here and I was soaking wet, you guys would first have questions. Why is James wet? 
right? That would be the first question. If I just walked up here and I am just dripping wet, you're going to be like, why is James soaked? It's going to be the first question. And then I can tell you, well, this is what happened. I go into the bathroom and I fell in. I'm like, wait, that doesn't explain how you got all that. How? Right? I mean, but I would explain to you how I got wet. But the second part is if I'm soaking wet and I came up to you and I gave you a big old hug, are you going to get wet too? You might not be soaked, but you're going to get wet. There is no way, unless you're somehow made out of plastic, which you're not, you're going to get wet. It's going to happen. And when God tells us to love because he is love, if we can have that same kind of concept, that theology where I am just so saturated by the love of God that one first thing people are going to ask is, why are you that way? And it gives you an opportunity to share. And then the second thing is when you get to embrace them and you get to touch them, they have the feeling, they have that, just, that saturation on them somehow. Imagine how much different our relationships would be if we were covered in God's love. Let's keep going. Marriage breaker number two. Undervalue your spouse. If marriage becomes a checklist item, you've not put the right value in your spouse. Here's what I mean. The American dream, right? Graduate, go to college. This is 30, 40 years ago. Graduate, go to college, get a job, get married, buy the house, save for retirement, die, right? That was the American dream. And it's very similar now where the school may not be as, you know, but you still have job, marriage, et cetera, et cetera. And if it becomes this checklist, like, well, you know, I've, I've, I've got my degree, I've, I've got a good job, I actually bought a house already. I'm, uh, yeah, I should, the next thing, the logical thing is I should just get married. When it becomes a checklist, it isn't a value that you've placed on your spouse. You've just checked off what's next. You've checked off that list, and it seems kind of sad because you're missing the fullness of what that relationship can be. And it makes me sad just thinking about that, right? If my viewpoint of marriage is that, well, I have to have a career first, and if I get married, uh, it will, it will uh, it'll put a dent in my career, where do you place the value? In your career and not in that relationship. And it goes back to that need that I talked about earlier, that selfishness that we have, where it has to be about us. It has to be about my needs, what I want. I have to have this first before I can give you that. You've placed that value below where it should be. I'll talk about where everything else should be in a second. It says in Matthew 6, 21, whenever, wherever your treasure is, there your desires will also, of your heart will also be. Now, in the context of this, He's actually talking about the love of money. I understand that, but this still applies in this circumstance. The context is money, but this does apply to our heart because he is talking about your heart and what it's connected to. And I'm looking at it. My marriage, if I were to look at it as something that gets in the way of my career, it's not going to make it. I don't know how many times that I've had conversations with guys and, and a few with some women where they're like, oh, I work 70 hours a week so that I can take care of my family. And I just, I kind of I turn my head and I say, well, when do you get to see your kids? When do you get to see your wife? When, oh, well, you know, they know what I'm doing for the family. I'm like, well, <laughs> how does that grow your family stronger, closer, healthier when you're not around? I personally have not seen an example where someone is working 70 to 75 hours a week and their family is strong and healthy. I just haven't seen it. There's always underlying examples of where that is, there, there's some, some things that need to be adjusted. So what should we do? Marriage maker number two, cherish your spouse. Rather than undervaluing your spouse, we need to cherish our spouse. I've been working through uh, an article on focus on the family, which I gave you, you know, the kids thing and it defined cherish this way. It says to hold or treat as dear, to feel love for, to care for tenderly, to nurture, and to cling fondly to. So to cherish someone means you recognize their importance and priority in your life. That means 
that you have God, number one, and that's supposed to be, that's biblical, right? God is our priority, nothing before God. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It's part of what Jesus talked about. This is number one, number one. Number two should be your significant other, your spouse. And then your kids and job and then everything else. Now, I know that the priorities shift based off of seasons, and I understand that, and that's fine. That happens. There are seasons in your life where that priority will shift as long as God stays number one. But seasons should never be years. It should not. Because then it's no longer a season. It is now the norm. Because what happens with a season? It goes away, right? And then another one comes. How many seasons do we have here? Four. In California, we have one. One season. Just hot, right? That's the season. But that's the difference that God is talking about here. Because without a healthy marriage, the family will break apart. I've been a pastor long enough. I've done enough counseling to have seen it time after time. If we do not place a priority in clinging fondly to our significant others, what's going to happen? Your family will start to break apart. So here's the next step this time. First one was prioritize God. This one. I want you guys to prioritize a date night this month. If you have a significant other, prioritize a date night. Pick a night. And I'm going to give you time later to to do this, and I'm going to explain the why. Okay? The why is because Jesus had no other focus. His only focus was to love us. He loved us with everything inside of him. He proved it by dying on the cross for us. That's how much he loved us. Which means that even though we didn't love him yet, he still died for us. That's the example that we are supposed to follow. It says in John 4.10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So we're talking about cherishing your spouse, the second marriage maker, right? Cherishing your spouse. How do we do that? How do we do that? One, it's to recognize the importance that they have, but two, it's to show with action. What did Jesus do with his love? What did he do? He took it and he gave it to us. He died for us. Now, I'm not a Bible expert, but guess what? The Bible says for us to love each other that same way. We're supposed to love each other the way that God loved us, the way that he loved the church. That's how we're supposed to love each other. That means that without hesitation, I as a husband need to put my wife's needs above my own. And it means that my wife, as my wife, needs to put my needs above her own. And what happens if you both place each other's needs above your own? You're both taken care of. The need to be selfish is gone because you're provided for. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we need to put on, you know, a toga and feed grapes to our wives, guys. Um, Unless you want to. There's a date night idea, I suppose. (laughs) It's your call. But that's immediately after the first command to men, which is, women, you need to honor your husbands the way that Jesus honored the church. This is a two-way street. And if we both are running together and towards each other, we're going to be taken care of. Now, I want to, there's a, on your, if you guys grabbed a program from the back, not only does it have the sermon uh, outline and all that fun stuff, on the front side, there's a little QR code that has date night ideas. We came up with nine different ideas based off of completely free to low cost to uh, splurge, treat yourself kind of situation. And you can can click on that. It'll give you some ideas, but there's a couple on there that I just wanted to give you an example so that you can kind of figure this or you can kind of see what what we're doing in there. Um, But one of them for the free was to just have a drive in at your house. Just take your wife, go to the garage, put the, or, you know, driveway if you don't park in the garage like we do. And you just put your iPad or computer on the screen, bring some snacks, some popcorn, and just do a drive-in movie in your garage. I know it seems lame, but it actually is really fun. It's a lot of fun. Maybe not today, because it's like you'll die of smoke inhalation. But later this week, when this all goes away, pick a time and do that. And my other favorite one on there was, um, it was in the Splurge Yourself. It's called a progressive dinner. You guys remember that? If you're old school Baptist, you know what a progressive dinner was, right? You went to people's houses and whatever. 
do a progressive dinner, just the two of you, in a city. Pick a city. Pick like Kirkland and go, we're going to go to an appetizer at one place. We're going to get our main course at another. And we're going to get dessert at another. And you just drive around the city and you just do a progressive dinner in the city of your choice. Super fun and super easy to do at the same time. If you don't know where to go, go to Yelp. They tell you where to eat. It's great. All right. Marriage breaker number three. Let's move on. Prioritize your own interest. This, will, this is not a good thing to do. If your future plans are based on pleasure, didn't mean to have so many P words there, what feels good now, what's going to happen? It's going to change because what feels good now does not feel good later, right? Am I the only one that feels that way? You guys all like to do the same thing over and over again, eat the same thing over and over again, watch the same thing over and over again? No, we like variety. We like to have options. And what happens in this circumstance is that you are driven or I am driven by the fear of loss. If I don't do this, then I will not get this. And because of that, we prioritize our own interests. And in a relationship, you might be tempted to think, if I don't put my foot down on this, then I'm never going to get this. And that temptation can be real. I had a friend Still do. I shouldn't. He's not not my friend anymore. But I have a friend, and he was uh, he he asked me for advice. He said, "James, I don't know what to do about my wife." I'm like, "Oh, this is gonna be good," because you know every good sentence starts with that. And and I said, "Well, what's going on?" He's like, "She just she's kind of grumpy all weekend." I'm like, "Just this weekend or every weekend?" He's like, "Every weekend she's grumpy." I'm like, "Really? I know her. Doesn't sound like her. What'd you do?" And he's like, I didn't do anything. I'm not even home. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I, I play golf on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm like, how long do you play? He's like, ah, a round takes about six hours. And there's a drive there and there's lunch. So about eight, eight and a half hours. It's like Saturday and Sunday, you play golf for eight and a half hours both days. He's like, yeah. And I'm trying to get him to see the problem here, right? And, and I said to him, um, Okay, why do you play so much golf? He's like, golf is amazing, James. I'm like, I know, I, I, I agree. He's all, and I work hard all week, and I, uh, that's my time to, to have some stuff that I get to do, and I just, you know, I serve the church, and, and I do all, this is my time, James, I have to have it. And I'm like, well, okay, well, that's fair, that's fair, that's fair. I, I see what you're doing here, but um, have you ever thought about asking your wife to go with you to go play golf? And he just looked at me like I shot one of his children. What? You want me to desecrate golf by bringing my wife? Like, that was the look that I got. And I said, oh, so no, you haven't. He's like, no, I haven't asked. No, she would never play. I know her. She wouldn't play. But you have you asked? Like, no. So how do you know that? He said, I just know my wife. Okay. See, that's what we say, men, if we don't want our wives to come along. Oh, I know her. She would never like this, right? That's, that's what he was doing. So then I started asking him some questions, which he doesn't like that. He's usually, um, most people don't. Um, and I started asking him questions. Well, why haven't you asked her? Well, I told you why, James, because, you know, she's, she doesn't like it. I said, well, maybe you should ask her and see what happens. And he just gave me a blank stare. It was almost as if his brain overheated and he just shut off. He just started staring at me. So then I realized that uh, this is not going to work in this certain this, this, this direction I was going in. So I went in a different direction. I said, well, let me ask you a question. What does your wife like to do since you know her so well? He's like, oh, well, she, she likes to cook and clean. I'm like, no, she doesn't like to do any of that. She does that for you and your family. He's like, oh, yeah, okay. Well, she, she and a bunch of women, they do this crafting thing together where they go to Pinterest and they look at stuff for like hours and then they make it at home. I'm like, oh, so she's like into DIY kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, she loves that stuff. I'm like, cool. Let me ask you a question. If your wife went and Tuesday nights, she did her DIY, would that bother you? He's like, no, no, not at all. I said, okay, cool. What if every Tuesday she left at five and she got home at midnight and she just went home and did, or went and did crafts with her friends? And she did that not only on Tuesdays, but she also did it on Thursdays. So Tuesdays and Thursdays, she's gone from 5 to midnight. As soon as you get home, she, she gives you a high five, I'm out the door. And he's like, that would never work. So what do you mean? 
He says, well, on Mondays, our kids have swim, so we, we both go to that. And on Wednesdays, we have small group, and I knew this. And, you know, of course, we serve on Sundays, and, and then that leaves. For, there's no, it would, it would never work, James. There's no way that she could do this. And as soon as he's saying this, you could see that the light bulb clicked in his head, and he's like, dang it, James, got me? And he just stopped talking. And he just got silent and started staring at me again. And I just looked at him, and I was like, okay. Um, so, you're saying her leaving for eight hours on a Tuesday and a Thursday night wouldn't work. But how long, remind me, how long are you gone for golf on weekends? And he just looked at me. Oh, he was mad. He didn't talk to me for like two weeks. He's like, I don't like this. I go, well, truth hurts, buddy. And he just left. Two weeks later, he... Um, he texts me. He's like, you were right. I'm like, I know, but tell me what was I right about? <laughs> and he was like, well, it was, a, it was the golf thing. You're right. So I know, I know. I just wanted you to say it. He's like, I was being selfish. And you know what I did, James? I actually asked my wife if she wanted to come play. And she said yes. And now she really likes it. I'm like, great. Is that bad? He's like, no, that's awesome. Because now I can play as much as I want. I just got to take my wife. <laughs> like, sweet. But this became a moment where they get to bond together and they started impact or started bringing their kids too. And their kids started learning how to play. And it became this family affair that they, they found this common interest together. See, what happens when you prioritize your interests is you have this fear of loss. And that's what he was, he was that was my friend's problem was he thought he was going to lose his weekend golf game. He's like, I can't do this. Oh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm going to lose it. And he did not want that. But he never thought about what he could gain. It says in John chapter, eight, chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Such love has no fear. And we're talking about fear because perfect fear, I'm sorry, perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for the fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced this perfect love. Verse 19, we love each other because he loved us first. Give God your fear. That's marriage maker number three. Give God your fear. Now he writes everyone's story differently. We have a path to pain that God will use to find strength. Every person in this room has experienced some sort of path to pain. In relationships, personally, we have it. And it's part of this broken world that we live in. But God has given us everything that we need to push through. He gives us emotional strength and spiritual strength to push through. And what I love about this is when we stop living in fear, it frees us to live how God designed us to live, which is fully loving each other the way that he loves us. I want to share a statement with you. Okay, this is a, what I call a love exercise. Let me sh I want to share two sentences. I have to serve my spouse. I get to serve my spouse. Is there a difference in that statement, in those two statements? The action is different, right? The tone is different. The same thing is happening. You're serving your spouse, but how you get there is different. You're doing one willingly, I, I get to serve my spouse, and the other one grudgingly, I have to serve my spouse. That little mind shift can be all the difference. We all have opportunities every single day to serve each other. We do, to serve our spouses. And when we do it with love that God gives us, we expunge fear. And that's huge. How much stronger will your marriage be if we loved like this? If instead of letting fear drive our actions, the fear of loss, the fear that we might lose what we thought we needed, and we got rid of that, and we allowed God's love that he gave us freely to flow and saturate out of us into not only our spouses, but our children and our friends and our family. How different would your life look? I would venture to say it would be so much fuller. So what I want to do today is I want to I close today with this thought. 
serve each other rather than being served. And what does that look like? Let me pray for you guys right now, and then there's one more thing we're going to do before we take off. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now. God, we pray for the relationships that are in this room. We pray for the relationships that are watching online, Father, that you strengthen them, that you, that there is a light bulb moment that clicks in our head, that it is not about a fear of loss. It is not about a grudging thing that we have to do, but this is something that you have blessed us with. We get to serve and love. And I just pray for that mind shift, that it goes from this, this doldrumy, uh, to I get to enjoy. And I just pray for that in our relationship in this room. I pray whether we are married, we used to be married, or we're going to be married one day, that you either prepare our hearts for future relationships or you soften them now for current ones. And I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to dive into different aspects of communication and relationships in the next three weeks. But before you leave today, if you are married, this is what I want you to do, and especially if you're sitting with your spouse. I want you to put on your calendar, pull your phone out, pick a day, and make it a date night. Like right now, before you leave, if your spouse is not in the room, pick a couple days and let them choose which one works better if your calendars aren't synced. But don't leave today without doing that. It's important. Your connection is important. It's so easy to go, oh, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. And then two, three, four months roll out, and you haven't done it. Don't let those opportunities slip. All right. That's enough, enough of me lecturing you guys. Have a great day, and I'll see you guys next week.